All right, 300, welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about calibration. Um, so in this video, we're going to go over how you perform a calibration experiment so you can figure out if your scale is working correctly and we can correct any bias errors and we can determine the resolution of your scale. All right, so first of all, let's talk about what calibration is generally. Calibration is the process of applying a known input value to an instrument to observe the output value. Right? We want to establish a relationship between input and output uh, values for an instrument so we can correct for any bias error. So here we've got a picture. We've got a thermometer going into a glass of ice water. Right? Melting ice will be zero degrees Celsius. We have a known temperature that we can apply to this thermometer to see if its output reading is correct and adjust it if necessary. All right. So to perform this calibration, we need these known inputs to the instrument. Right, so these known uh, inputs are known as standards. Um, so a standard is a, a carefully constructed um, experiment or some sort of input that we can put into an instrument to know if it's producing a correct output or correct its output. Um, so a few examples of standards you might have, have seen before. Um, we have things like these masses, these laboratory standard masses that are all um, very precise pieces of metal that weigh a certain number of grams that we can put on a scale and see if its output is correct. Uh, we also have things like gauge blocks that you can use for uh, calibrating lengths, right? So these are uh, pieces of material that are ground to um, very high levels, of very high tolerances to, so that, that we know exactly how long they are. Um, and then for different instruments that uh, do different types of analyses, you'll see different types of standards. One example of these is if you're calibrating an instrument that does gas analysis, so it tells you what gases are, are made of, you uh, might purchase some of these little bottles, which are pre-mixed uh, gas standards, um, where you know exactly the concentration of gases inside of that bottle, and you can hook that, that bottle up to your instrument, run it through there, and make sure your instrument is performing correctly before you perform uh, your actual experiment where you're looking to collect data. All right, so here's what we're trying to establish when we are doing a calibration experiment. We're trying to build a calibration curve. All right, so what we want to do is we want to apply several of these known values or standards to the instrument and we record the output of the instrument. Then we plot the output on the y-axis and the input on the x-axis and we fit a curve. So we get a simple sort of polynomial curve, hopefully linear is the best case, it doesn't always have to be. Um, that describes how the output varies as a function of the input, right? This is known as a static calibration, so that you may hear about dynamic calibrations also. Um, what we're talking about with static calibration is that we're not worried about how quickly the instrument responds. We're going to give the instrument lots of time uh, to settle out and to reach an equilibrium before we change the value that's being applied to it. So this is generally what we do when we're doing something like a scale. We're not concerned so much about the mass varying really quickly. We just put, the, put a given mass on the scale, let it come up with its measurement until it's settled, and then we take that as the, um, the output when we're building our calibration curve. All right, so to perform a calibration, we always need at least two points so that we can draw a line between them. Um, we can do what's called a single point calibration where we know zero and then one other point. So we have a, a single point besides zero and we use that for our calibration. Right? Um, this assumes that the instrument is linear over the calibration range, which may or may not be a good assumption. So it's always preferable to do a multi-point calibration where we have multiple standards that we apply to our instrument and we build the calibration curve. Right? That confirms that the, the instrument was linear over a calibration range if the instrument is in fact linear, but it also allows you to do things like use a nonlinear uh, sensor. So your thermistor is a good example of that where you have this log function that describes how the uh, thermistor works. In that case, we can build that log function by taking a multi-point calibration and fitting data to uh, that multi-point calibration curve. Right? And that allows us to use devices that are nonlinear. All right, um, so and th that would look something like this here. So if we fit, we can just fit any function. It doesn't necessarily have to be a linear function um, to uh, if, if we have a multi-point multi calibration curve. All right, 
Um, one of the things that we like about calibration is it allows us to quantify and correct for bias errors. Um, so we can basically just, just if, if we have a shift, a baseline shift of our instrument where it's not producing you know, zero volts at ex when the, the input is zero, um, we can handle that's okay. Right, we can take care of that with a calibration curve because our, our curve fit will account for that shift anyways. Right, um, it makes a really simple mathematical function um, where we can convert the instrument's output into engineering units. So you've noticed here on my graph here, I've actually flipped the x and the y axes because that's a handy trick to do when you have your calibration curve. Is if you flip the x and the y um, and then refit a curve to that, now you have the scales input so like mass as a function of the scales response so if your your uh, out, output is volts or frequency we can take frequency throw it into this function and get mass back right and we can fit it's just a simple polynomial curve probably even a linear function that's really easy to program into a sub vi and it will produce a, a calibrated output for our scale right Okay, so the way that we're going to go about um, actually doing this for your scale is we want to get various mass standards. So we have a bunch of these calibrated uh, laboratory weights that you can use. We also have some, some digital scales that you can weigh whatever items you have around the lab um, and use those as standards also. We just need some sort of, of well-characterized. We know that this mass is, is, weighs this many grams that you can place on your scale and uh, use that as a standard. All right, so what you want to do is find various ones um, and we'll plot the instrument's output as a function of input. So in this case, I'm using volts. Some of you guys might have frequency as your scale response. That's okay. You just have frequency on the y-axis instead of volts. And we're going to plot a bunch of points and we should obtain some sort of function that converts um, mass to a scale output, right? Or like volts in this case here. Right, so that's your function that you start off with. Right, next, what you're going to do is you'll flip your x and your y axes. Right, so you have the the inverse of the function here. So you, the easiest way to do that is to just replot the data, um, flipping the x and the y axes, and then refit the data, so that you get a polynomial or a linear function that uh, gives you mass as a function of the scale's response. In this case, it's volts. Right. Um, so the cool thing about this is you don't need to know exactly what the spring constant of the spring in your scale is or exact material properties. All that's getting taken care of by performing this calibration experiment. That polynomial curve, it's all baked into that one. So you don't have to work out um, the exact values and then come up with this complex mathematical function that converts your scale's response into a mass. It's just handled for you by this calibration curve, right? Um, so the reason why we've been estimating those in class and kind of working through that is it's important for your design work so that you can verify that your scale will work ahead of time. You can basically ballpark, you know, this is a, a effectively what the scale should do when I build it. Um, as long as I see something close to this, I have confidence that my scale is working properly. Um, that's why we go through that exercise. It's important. It saves you a lot of time and heartache in the lab um, because you know what you're looking for. And if you get something that's significantly different than that, you know your scale's not working and it helps guide your troubleshooting, right? Um, but having that experimental calibration curve makes it much, much easier to program your scale so that it'll output mass in grams um, to the front panel of your VI. All right, there's a couple of important parameters we can pull off of the um, calibration curve also. One of them is the static sensitivity, right? Which is just the slope of the calibration curve, right? So it can uh, be a constant if you have a linear function. It doesn't have to be a constant. It can just be evaluated at different points. That's also OK. So in general, a larger static sensitivity means that you have a bigger response. Your scale responds more to a change in input than a scale with a smaller static sensitivity. Um, let's, and that, then typically, um, the static sensitivity is a trade-off with the instrument's range also. So most instruments have a sort of maximum reading above which they become saturated, which just means they stop responding or maybe they stop responding in a predictable fashion. Um, and when you have a high static sensitivity, your slope is, is really steep. You're going to hit that maximum reading um, before a less sensitive instrument will. Right. Here's a good example of how that would work. So let's think about we have two 
um, scales, right? That are based off of a spring. So these are kind of like your classic fish scales where you pull on the spring, the more the spring um, extends, the heavier the, the mass is, right? And we put 100 grams on each of those. And this is, this is kind of the result we get. Which of these scales has a larger static sensitivity? Right. In this case, it's going to be the one on the right over here because it's stretching more for a given input than the one on the left. Right. So that's, that has a higher static sensitivity. It responds more for, to a given input than the scale on the left does. Now, uh, the trade-off here is if we wanted to put a bigger mass, so let's say we put 1,000 grams on instead of 100 grams, the, the scale with the stiffer spring that's responding less, the less sensitive instrument, is going to be able to cover a larger range because the uh, scale with that lighter spring that has a high static sensitivity is going to get stretched out to its maximum length sooner than the one that's that's got a lower static sensitivity, right? So that's the trade-off between range and static sensitivity. All right, and this leads us to the last thing that we can get from the calibration curve, which is as part of your calibration experiment, you can determine the resolution um, of your scale, right? So the way we're gonna be doing this is you need to take several independent measurements of uh, no weight on the scale. So your known reading of zero grams on the scale. Okay, and these have to be independent. So make sure you watch the video lecture on the student T table and calculating uncertainty because this is very important that your zero measurements are independent from one another. The way I suggest doing that is you turn your scale on, you take a zero measurement, then you put a mass on the scale, take a reading, take the mass off, take another reading, take a different mass, put it on the scale, take a reading, take the mass off, take another zero reading, until you get five or six um, independent zero readings that way. Then from there, you can use the student T table to determine a 95% confidence interval for what the, the output of your instrument is going to be when there's no mass on the scale. All right, so that'll determine if, if you have no mass on the scale, 95% of the time the readings are gonna fall in this, this range of values here. Well. That means if you get a reading outside of that range, you can be confident that that is, is not a false read. It's not just zero with noise on top of it. That's a real reading and you're actually seeing a mass. Okay, so that's gonna be the smallest mass that you can reliably detect with your instrument. So you can find that using the calibration curve. So you take your 95% confidence interval here, I've shown it on the, the Y axis. So 95% of our, our zero measurements are gonna fall within those error bars. And we can trace the top of that error bar over to the calibration curve and find the mass that corresponds with uh, when we get out of that, that confidence interval, right? And that is the smallest mass that we can see. So we typically call that your resolution or your limit of detection, right? So limit of detection typically gets used um, in like chemistry of like how, how small of an amount of this chemical can you see um, in a given sample. That's kind of the, the term that uh, gets thrown around in, in chemistry, whereas resolution uh, gets, is, a, is a little bit more general and talks about, is talked about in a wide variety of fields. So for a scale, resolution is probably the correct term, but in general, those two things are, are mostly interchangeable terms, okay? So that is how you would determine the resolution of your scale. So with that, you should have the information that you need to complete your scale um, calibration experiment and get the data that you need for your Design Challenge 1 report. As always, swing by the lab and ask questions if you've got them.